we are now live on YouTube as well, and, and we are audible and visible to the audience. I am, can we start now? Yes, sir. Yeah, Atanu, sir. You can start because we are live now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Professor Call is here, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah good, morning. good morning. Good morning, Atanu. Yes, sir. Good morning. So, very good morning to everyone. So, on behalf of the Cognitive Neurology subsection of the Indian Academy of Neurology, I welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, this is probably the first, uh, this is the first webinar we are conducting in this year. In our last business meeting at uh, Madurai, we decided that we'll have frequent webinars, uh, at least once in two months. And uh, we approached to the academy and we are happy that the office bearers have given us the permission to hold these webinars regularly. And uh, as Dr. Faim is a very young, energetic convener, he is uh, planning for the webinars and he will describe these in his, uh, after a few minutes. Cognitive neurology is a very new subspecialties and now it has uh, become uh, one of the more interesting one to the practicing neurologist throughout the world because of many reasons. One of them is the availability of biomarkers and of course, the, with the hope of getting some treatment for the diseases, uh, particularly the Alzheimer's disease. But it was not that easy when we started our cognitive neurology subsection in the Indian Academy of Neurology. Almost more than a decade ago, when only few a handful of neurologists, they, after getting trained or by because of their sheer interest, fascination to the subject, they started a cognitive clinic and memory clinic at different parts of the country, different institutes, and subsequently faced various, various difficulties. One of the more important challenges was non-availability of the tools, internalized tools, culturally adapted tools, and also the ignorance, ignorance in the part of the patients and also in part of the doctors and also the neurologist. As you know, the cognition gets affected in any disease that affects the central nervous system. Say in stroke, demyelination, movement disorder or any degenerative disease. And unless a neurologist pay attention to this part of the neurological examination, particularly the cognition, the whole management remains incomplete. So it is important for the young neurologist or the students to learn cognition from the experts. And we have planned this webinars to have frequent case discussions, general clubs, and occasionally direct lectures from the seniors. So today, to help me or help us, I, we are very glad to have Professor Subhas Kaul who is one of the senior most neurologists in this country and who has in 27 years of teaching experience at the Nijams Institute of uh, Neurosciences in Hyderabad. Then he, he was the head of the department there for a long time. Then after his retirement, he is joined and now is the faculty at the Kim's Hyderabad, where he is also the chairman of the Research Advisory Board. He has several awards to his credit. Some of them are the very prestigious State Teacher Award from Telangana government in 2017. He steered the Stroke Foundation in this country and he was the founder member of the Indian Stroke Association. He was the past president of that Indian Stroke Association. 
his registry, Hyderabad Stroke Registry, is one of its kind in the country and also probably in the South Asia. He has numerous publications, more than 130 in the peer reviewed journals, and he was the principal and co investigator in several national and international subjects. He's one of the finest speakers, his finest teachers. We all learn from him. Whenever uh, he encouraged his students to pursue their uh, goal, I always met him and I found him uh, encouragement from him. He was the past president of the Indian Academy of Neurology and he was the first chair of this cognitive neurology subsection. I request Professor Call to speak a few words about the our subsection and also this webinar. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Dr. Atnu, um, for the kind and warm introduction. You know, in uh, 1998 or so, when Dr. Suvarna joined our department in Hyderabad, Nizam Institute, uh, so that was the time when everybody wanted to do some subspeciality. So I asked Dr. Suvarna that what was she thinking? And she said she wants to take cognition. And I remember that I, as a friend, I discouraged her. I said that uh, after doing so hard, you have already done NIMHANS and all that's over. Now you should become a neurologist. And she said, no, I'm interested in cognition. Uh, I said, no, it, it's, not a good, it, it's not a good future for you. <laughs> and she said, why? I said, it's not stylish. It's not glamorous. And she gave only one answer. She said, for me, it is. And I think that was a very powerful answer, you know. Uh, for me, it is. I said, okay. And all she wanted was one chair and one table and one small room so that she could start a, what she would call an auto rickshaw memory clinic with minimum uh, facility, just the will to do that. And I think uh, slowly and steadily, uh, everybody recognized the memory clinic. The first paper which we published was on stroke only because it was readily available there. I had a stroke registry and shared a memory registry, and that was her first publication, I remember. And uh, then, you know, because my introduction, my window to cognition is through Dr. Suarna, that's why I'm starting with that. Then she moved around and traveled over the country, attended Indian Academy of Meetings, and met many like-minded people. And that is the most wonderful thing. You know, Atino, I think she met you, and uh, she met Amitabh and she met others. And uh, I think latest is Fahim. Uh, and this finding like-minded people is the big challenge in life, you know. And once you find them, you should never leave them. Just hold them. And because that is how you can move mountains, to find the like-minded people. And uh, I think in the journey of that in Indian Academy, I remember she... Uh, um, uh, because if you have to grow within the Academy, you have to have presence, you have to have... A group, and I remember how assiduously uh, all of you, because I remember, I, I remember those days. It's very fresh in my memory. Suvarna, Atnu, and others. You wanted to have some ten members, and you could not get even ten members at that time. <laughs> so you counted me as one vote, as one member, and that's how I became the first chairman of that uh, your section. But you, uh, you did just simply wonderful. And uh, some cognitive um, schools you did. I think Suarna went for fellowship. And uh, I remember Thomas Back and others from time to time. I have participated in all of those. They are very, very educative uh, sessions which you did, WFN sessions. And, uh, you know, uh, I have seen that how uh, this, this movement has grown now, uh, this small cognitive movement, how it has grown. And from that small chair, in the from the small chair auto rickshaw memory clinic, you have uh, Swarna has become now chair of the World Federation of Neurology Cognitive Section, and it's a recognition not only of Swarna but for the whole group, for the whole movement which he represents. Uh, so I'm very happy and I'm very you know privileged to be part of it. And to the youngsters, I want to say those who are attending, because the whole focus of these webinars, IAN webinars, is addressed to young. The people I already saw, there are some 47, 48, I think they will grow. I want to tell them out of my personal experience is that in, uh, you know, the difference between a uh, average physician and a brilliant physician is whether he knows neurology or not. In our time, we used to say, 
if you see in, in your own cities, if you see, I think Fahim will be knowing in Kashmir, we had a very legendary physician called Ali Jan. He was legend. He was thought God. And the only difference between him and others was that he knew neurology. He knew spinal muscular atrophy when nobody else knew that. So today, the difference between an average neurologist and a brilliant neurologist is the one who knows cognition. Otherwise, everybody can write parastamol and rituximab and all. It's not everybody can do that. But the difference between an average neurologist and a bright neurologist is if you know cognition, if you know what is dis-executive syndrome, if you know what is disinhibited behavior, all the terms that you use. And it is such a great opportunity for all of us, for the residents. I wish I was a resident today because there was so much to learn from the experts. So once again, I uh, welcome all the residents and I congratulate and thank the cognition section for starting this series of webinars. Thank you. I request Fahim, Dr. Fahim to start the webinar with introduction and introducing our first speaker. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adhanu, sir, for giving that background and setting the context of uh, cognitive neurology subsection. And thanks, Dr. Subhashko, sir, for highlighting the importance of uh, this cognitive neurology branch and also giving us a beautiful history and experience uh, of uh, cognitive neurology with what uh, sir had with Swara, madam. So, uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, and in addition, uh, I also want to say that cognitive neurology subsection owes its inception in I and to your visionary leadership, sir. And I think because you have been the first chair, so really, it, it's really important for a whole group to know that who was the actual person who really started all this. So, first of all, I think I would like to express my gratitude to the office bearers of IN, Dr. Devashish Chaudhary, President IN, and Dr. Yumi Nakshi Sundaram, uh, Secretary IN, for giving us an opportunity to start these uh, cognitive neurology subsection webinars. And also to all the senior members of our subsection for giving their inputs and uh, uh, providing their support. The, see, the idea behind these webinars, as already Dr. Call said, uh, is, it's not only to demystify dementia, but to raise awareness among uh, residents about dementia. It's about raising awareness among these healthcare professionals, especially residents in medicine, in psychiatry, in neurology. So that once they work in setups like primary care centers, secondary or tertiary care centers, they know they should be able to diagnose or if not, they can refer patients to higher centers. That's also very important because what we usually see patients come with a lot of delay in diagnosis. And then a point comes where we don't, we may not be able to do much, but still something can be done at that point of time. So there's a lot of gap in knowledge. There's a lot of gap in awareness. And then there's a diagnostic gap. So in, L in LMICs, especially in India as well, the diagnostic gap is 10%. Only 10% of dementias are being diagnosed. So, so that highlights the importance of uh, doing such academic activities so as to raise awareness. This is also because dementia is considered as a complex, com very complex disorder. And the notion is that it's a dead end and they say nothing much can be done. So why do we need to know about it? But we need to change this perspective and make everyone aware that it's just a bend in the road and we need to see beyond the bend so that we can help our patients. At least their quality of life can become better. And uh, recently also, uh, we, there are newer drugs which have come up for Alzheimer's and there's a role of biomarkers, as Dr. Atanu said. The question is whether can we use those drugs in our population? Do we need clinical trials in India? Do, should we have the clinical trials or we should directly use those drugs? So these are the questions which still require a lot of discussion. And that's what we will try to cover uh, such topics in our webinars from basics to advanced in a, a simplified manner and have uh, international and uh, national experts speaking and taking debates on uh, these topics. So that will be our brief mandate for future webinars and we'll be open for feedback and suggestions from all our senior members. So I think without further delay, uh, we'll just start the first talk of uh, today's webinar. And it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, speaker for uh, today's talk, my mentor, my guide, Dr. Sona Ladi Madam, and uh, a mentor hard to find, difficult to forget with that much of passion, as Dr. Call said. Uh, Dr. Aladi, she's the professor and head of the department of neurology in Nimhans. She she doesn't need any introduction. World knows her. Everybody knows her locally as well as globally. It's just a, this is just a brief CV. And if you really have to introduce her, it will take two three webinars. So uh, let us be very short. And I'm going to highlight some of her important work. And uh, Madam has done her fellowship in cognitive neurology from Cambridge University, UK. 
she has a clinical and uh, professional experience of more than 20 years in the field with many international and national projects and publications including high impact journals like brain neurology stroke and in and lancet as well in the areas of dementia vascular cognition bilingualism and public health though she has an exhaustive list of professional associations the main highlights are that she has been a founder secretary cognitive neurology subsection of IAN and also the founder president RC Hyderabad the Deccan chapter the recent association is with the World Federation of Neurology where she is the chair of the specialty group on cognitive disorders and she is also the vice chair of Alzheimer's Association International Society to advance Alzheimer's research and treatment which is the I start group which is really appreciable and then last but not the least and most importantly she has recently been appointed as a member of the esteemed World Dementia Council, representing whole Asia. And this is a recognition of Madam's commitment, her passion, her leadership in the field of dementia. And it's an honor and pride for all of us. We congratulate Madam for this. And uh, now I think now the audience will agree with me. Who else could have been a better person to demystify dementia today in this first webinar of Cognitive Neurology Subsection of IAN? Thank you, Madam, for accepting our invitation for this talk on the clinical approach to diagnosis of dementia. And uh, over to you, Madam. The screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ratano Fahim, for starting the first webinar and congratulations on starting the first webinar of the Cognitive Neurology subsection. Very grateful to Professor Call. Uh, just one disclosure to all the students. I'm actually even just talking to the students. We were all students once. We continue to be students. The reason I think all of us have done something in dementia was because there was a need. In 1998, when I started this post-DM, uh, the patients with dementia were the ones waiting in the OPDs, which always caused trouble for us. They will complain to the management or they will come, they will get angry with us. So if Dr. Kaul remembers, they were the patients in those hundreds who would have the most trouble. And that was the need of the hour then, because it was just a few years ago, Dr. Kaul, Present, uh, published a paper from Kashmir saying that there were no patients of dementia found. And that was also true because our population was not so old then. But since 1998, when there was a need to do something for people with dementia, and now over the last 20 years, the need has only grown. So I'm very grateful to every student who has come here, joined us today. Dr. Kaul, the future is in safe hands. I think we can have coffee. Because there are so many youngsters here who are so good, who are so much better. And I think their voices have to be heard. Uh, Dr. Atri is representing them today with Dr. Fahim, but there are many others. I see Dr. Sita here. She has been a good friend uh, and um, supported this work in NIMS as well as in IAN. I can see very many seniors on the on the webinar. Professor Tally, Professor JMK Murthy, our regards, sir, to both of you. I can see Vikram, Suman, so and I have not checked more recently. So we're actually to all the new young students who have joined. Uh, there are legends here, which is only respect to older people who are forgetful today. And they're all there in our families, and they're our patients. And it's not difficult to help them. And it's just one more aspect of neurology that, um, that you will have to learn a little bit so that you can help the patients and get on to doing what you want to do in your life. So I'll spend, I think I should really, I'll cut down my talk if you don't mind, because I want to hear the case discussion. But I'll spend about 15 minutes uh, talking about an introduction. And uh, we'll see. Right. Can you see the slides? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we can see the slides. Right. So, as I mentioned, one, seven out of 100 people above the age of dementia today, above the age of 60 today, will have dementia. So, if you take an OPD group of, if there are about 50, 50 people older than the age of 60 years, it is likely that four or five will have dementia of some sort. So these patients are there and this is our, and it is an opportunity to provide care for them. 
the challenges for diagnosis are to be as early as possible and to be as specific as possible. It's not just enough to say dementia under evaluation because uh, there are uh, some very um, um, new forms of medication and also some very traditional forms of treatment that can actually reverse the cause in many cases. And more importantly, dementia, any disease of the brain can cause um, uh, dementia because cognition is distributed all over the brain. It can be stroke, multiple sclerosis, injury, um, infections, inflammation, degenerative diseases, neurometabolic diseases of late onset. So literally any brain disease can cause dementia. And how do these patients come to us? They come to us with a range of symptoms, like uh, they can have weakness or sensory loss or uh, ataxia. They can say they have become forgetful or that you know the mother is behaving strangely. They can't seem to find the right word when they speak or somebody has lost their way or somebody has become very withdrawn or not able to recognize me. So I was recently talking to my daughter who is not a doctor. She refused to do medicine, but she does humanities. And so I was saying, you know, medicine, dementia is like any other disease because if you get cut, you get sutured. If you break a leg, you get uh, repair the fracture. Or, you know, if you have a neuropathy, say, for instance, your leg is weak. And so we have to tell them the diagnosis and we have to educate them. And then as a 22-year-old, she said, it is not the same because if you're telling somebody that their mother or father has dementia, you're telling them that they will not recognize you very soon. And that is an entirely different uh, thing compared to other medical disorders. You are telling them that they will forget, they will forget to be who they thought they were, who the son or daughter thought they were. So this first thing in the diagnosis, the reason we have to be very respectful to making the right diagnosis, and also communicating this to the family members is, is, I think, the most crucial thing. It's better not to make a diagnosis if you are not able to communicate it well. And this is something I, uh, Dr. Fahim sees most of the dementia patients now uh, in, in IMHANS. Um, and I think this is his experience even now that the, the diagnosis has not been communicated by the previous doctor properly. And so there's extreme distress because when you Google uh, forgetfulness, you get a range of diagnosis. So I think the first step is to make the communicate the diagnosis in a way that does not distress them. So you have to communicate the diagnosis, but you have to say, I am there for you if um, through this long journey and we are there for you. And that is why I think time is of... Time and empathy are two, two important things that, uh, that I think, uh, as I've learned, start. I, I, it used to be difficult to train people on how to do, how to make a diagnosis dimension. This I've learned from my junior colleagues that what they are needing to draw on is empathy uh, and having some time. Professor Tally taught us this. He said there are three reasons why somebody would make it. You don't have a proper instrument and you don't have the time and the place to make your diagnosis. So I think this is even more important in dementia. And as I mentioned, you have to try and find out the cause. There's lots of scientific advances. Every day there's a new paper which is saying something about the pathology. But essentially, if it's a degenerative cause, amyloid, tau, synuclein, TDP43, vascular, and a combination of this. Why is this important? Because it appears that treatment actually seems possible now. The recent uh, approval from the FDA of lecanemab uh, is uh, very exciting. But uh, maybe in the future seminars, webinars, they will tell you about the complexity of using this and, and, and all of that. But you should be aware that there is a drug. And they will ask you, so how do you address that as for another day? So when you make a diagnosis, you have to know what is normal cognition. You have to know your friends. What is memory? What is language? And then you have to know your enemies. What are those brain changes that happen in disease? And it is not easy because there are so many symptoms. There are so many etiologies, so many new investigations. We cannot hold all that information in our brain 
and make the right diagnosis. You might have read yesterday about Lewy body, the patient in front of you, you will think that he has Lewy body dementia. So these are all the processes that you have to, only comes by seeing one patient after another patient, after another patient, learning from experience. So there's one thing important in diagnosis, it is to spend time and to see as many patients as possible. How do we do it? We make patterns and we compare them from the literature that we know and from the past patients that we have seen like any other neurological disease. So the first thing is, these are the main cognitive domains. If you look at the DSM criteria for dementia, it says there has to be a progressive decline in two or more of these domains. So it's attention, social cognition, memory, language, visual, spatial, praxis, executive functioning. So there has to be an impairment of any of these two domains. It has to affect their day-to-day -day life, whether it's a judge in giving judgments, a farmer in just walking and watching the sunset, but it has to affect their day-to-day -day life. And this will give us a clue about the diagnosis. But in the real world, when the patient walks in with the caregiver, they don't come again. I would like to quote Professor Tally. He used to ask us, have you read, has the patient read the book before he has come? In dementia, very rarely do they read the book. They will tell you what is bothering them the most. So these are the host of symptoms and these are just like a fraction of what could be the symptoms that they come us with. How do we make sense of them? If the person is misplacing objects, losing train of thought, forgetting appointments, unable to concentrate, difficulty in completing tasks. This is attention and executive functioning that we will hear a little more about from the case. If there is something that they've experienced, they've actually experienced something, a visit, a guest, a wedding, an event, and they've forgotten that whole event, then it is an episodic memory disturbance. Because they've forgotten it, they will keep asking for it again and again. And misplacing objects could be attention, but it could be something that they have kept very safely somewhere, paid attention to where they have kept it, but they've entirely forgotten it, then it is a memory problem. If they don't know what time it is, it basically means that they're not keeping track of time. They don't know what is yesterday and day before. That is a feature of memory disturbance. Naming is the most important thing for language. The first symptom that we pick up is a naming difficulty. They forget names of people and objects. They do not understand what is being said to them. Substitute the wrong word. This grammar comes down. They cannot read and write. For visuospatial, it is losing way in familiar places. Apraxia, clumsiness while handling objects. Neglect, not able to respond to one side of the body. Always go through the behavior. Apathy is a very non-specific symptom, but dull, withdrawn behavior, not interested. The usual question that you're asked in the exam is, is it apathy? Is it depression? So you will see these symptoms play out in the cases that are being discussed in these webinars. Delusions, agitations, agitation, very non-specific. Aggression, depression, disinhibition, loss of empathy. Depression and dementia have a very close relationship. They're bidirectional. A depressed person has a higher risk of developing dementia. Dementia patients also can have depression in the beginning. So when you come to these symptoms, some of these symptoms will stand out. If a person has food fadism, it's probably a frontotemporal dementia or a secondary cause which is mimicking a frontotemporal dementia. If a person is neglecting one side, it is, a, it is neglect. So these are what are called specific to diagnosis. Losing way in familiar places, a visual spatial, forgetting a full event. So these are all the symptoms that will tell you Amongst all those, oh, this is probably the diagnosis. So pay attention to picking out a symptom that is specific to a diagnosis. There are some which are non-specific, which is very important to, to understand, but may not help you to make an etiological diagnosis. Now, what about the cognitive tests? I won't go too much into it, into it but digit forward will give you a good memory attention uh, idea of that attention. Digit backward will give you working memory because they have to manipulate the information. Anything that you have to hold and manipulate. So just spend 10 seconds trying to do digit backward. Trying to do 100 minus 7 or 20 minus 3. Or saying the weeks of the day backward. Or spelling a word 
backward. So where everybody you're holding that information and you're manipulating, that is working memory. If we understand the cognitive process in ourselves, then you can, you know, extrapolate it to some extent. Memory, they have to learn new things and they have to be able to hold that information and recall. It's when they enter the clinic, you can say, I'm Dr. Suvarna, I come from Hyderabad, I've been in Bangalore for eight years. So that's something that a new stranger would tell them when they met them. Then at the end of the interview, you can say, you know, did I say something about myself? Do you remember it? But don't, you know, confront them like that. But, you know, you can then say that, look, my name is Suvarna, try and remember next time. So like that, you can give a name and address recall, story recall, word list recall. And then for the more remote memories in every decade of their life, ask them which school they went to, when did they get married, what were their jobs, how many grandchildren they have. You'll get a fine sense of their organization of memory with a few questions related to their personal lives. Semantic memory is more for concepts, so names of animals is a good thing. For language, I think most of you know this, spontaneous speech, understanding, repetition, naming, reading, writing. For spatial, we use visual construction and visual perception. We can read KMAT so well, a patient with posterior cortical atrophy will find it impossible to read a specific test. Praxis. In the clinic, just ask them to imitate these meaningless gestures. Don't worry about match and uh, all of that. But when you have a patient where you suspect apraxia, you can do the more complex te tests. Frontal lobe tests is all about planning, ability to shift from one concept to another, and being flexible in the mind and fulfilling the goals without errors. This is the frontal assessment battery, very simple to do, and you can do it safely in your patients. So once you have done this history and examination, you want to localize the pathology like in neurology. So attention is very frontal, but also right hemispheric. Executive functioning is frontal. And there are different areas in the prefrontal cortex for different aspects of executive functioning. Memory, ep episodic memory or personal memory is the typical um, circuit from the medial temporal lobe through the thalamus. There are very strategic areas. If you get a stroke there, you will have memory loss like fornix or dorsal medial nucleus of thalamus, medial temporal lobe, sometimes in the internal capsule. And then you have language, a dominant hemisphere, usually left visuospatial, parietal, there you have what and where. So what, uh, where is um, in the dorsal aspect, what is in the more ventral aspect. That means if I see this cup, to be able to hold it, I use the dorsal aspect to know it is a cup, it is a ventral aspect, its shape and all of that. Praxis is bilateral, again, left parietal as the dominant area. So once you have done this, this is a study from NEJM, which looks at any kind of clinical uh, diagnosis. Select a pivotal or key finding, then aggregate the group of findings into patterns. Generate a cause list, usual infection, inflammation, metabolic, degeneration, traumatic. Prune it to the most likely cause, select the cause, and then comes the role of diagnosis where you validate the diagnosis. We never get bored in our clinic when we see patients with uh, cognitive neurology. I think most neurologists don't get bored even with backache because every patient is interesting. But cognitive neurology will be very interesting because each person's history, their personalities, their circumstances are so different that in spite of them having Alzheimer's pathology, one patient is not like the other. The challenges, like Dr. Ratanu Bishwa said, are you cannot test an illiterate person, the, the flower seller in LB Nagar in Hyderabad. We asked her, what is, uh, in which city you are in? She said LB Nagar. She didn't even say Hyderabad, but she knows the roads of LB Nagar so well. So how do you tap into their cognition? Diversity of languages. If you don't know the language, it's always complex. So you'll need a translator and you need tests to say that something is really impaired. We don't have too many neuropsychologists, so you can get some basic idea or work with a good one. Now, very briefly, <clears throat> I will uh, go into some of the screening tests. The MMSC is something that is a good test. For illiterates, it's a Hindi mental state examination. Recommend that we do it for all our subjects as a quite a general idea. 
But then if you want to get little more idea, it's also a cognitive screening test. You have the Edinburgh's cognitive evaluation. So that's available in different languages. You just have to email one of us. You'll get all the, and keep a copy. They're also available. You can keep it on your phone. <clears throat> just yesterday, we were able to publish the illiterate uh, Edinburgh's cognitive examination. This is doctor, led by Dr. Atanu with Bidisha and Avanti. So this is also available for illiterates. Please use the right uh, uh, test. And this is the MOCA, which all of you use. Professor Kaul has led this for us because it's used mostly in stroke. And then you have MOCA and there are several different languages that we, uh, that is again freely available. And then if you find a patient where you have you know, mild cognitive impairment, that seven word list recall or three words in MMSC are just not enough. He remembers two words, one word. What does it mean to remember one out of three words? You might want to test his memory a little more. You might want to test his language a little more because you think it's an aphasia. So then you need to do a more detailed testing. You don't have to do all these batteries, but you have to pick up one or two tests in the battery that will help you make the right diagnosis. This is the Indian Council of Medical Research Neurocognitive Toolbox uh, that uh, is available now freely. Again, the website has it. We can share it with you. Maybe for him, you can just send it to IAN webinar, their group, and they can share it. And it's very easy to do, little bit of training. And these are the tests, like I said, attention, memory, language, visual, spatial functions, neglect, and behavior. For illiterates, we have this stick test. You can just have four math sticks and make a design and ask them to copy and then remember after some time. Now, this is something that we are doing very newly, but it, I wonder why we took so long to do this. We are actually doing performance-based tests. That means what? This is our fancy lab in Nimhans. We have a space called a cognitive neurology lab. Now with the team that we have worked with, we just ask them to cook a meal or go to a shop and buy a few things or pack a bag for two days. And the amount of information that we are getting, this is an ICMR sponsored project, we are getting from them and is incredibly useful to make a diagnosis and also for the caregiver to see. And then we, in, we are doing multidisciplinary care so we are validating this. We can't just do it like that. So we have proper scoring systems. So for instance, this is the lift in our uh, cognitive neurology ward. And this is the lab. So we tell them you turn right, go left, and there's a little shopping cart over there. And, and then there is a list of words that we give them to go and buy. So they have to go there, buy it. And then the shopkeeper, who's usually a psychologist or even a resident, will say, um, uh, well, did you did you want bread or did you want butter? So you get recognition memory. And I think this is really going to make a difference. It's helping us to make a better diagnosis. We'll have to validate this. How do you come to etiology? Medial temporal is Alzheimer's disease. Concepts is semantic memory loss, visual spatial loss. So this is where imaging is so important. Different parts or networks in the brain participate in different domains. We are now moving towards the era of biomarkers, blood biomarkers that measure amyloid tau, neurodegeneration, GFAP, NFL. So all these bewildering terms are your future and you will have to deal with them. And I think all of you are very good at this kind of information. You do it in multiple sclerosis, you do it in um, infection. So these are all biomarkers, but they are not as well validated and you will have to really, we have to still, and they're very expensive. Unfortunately or fortunately, today to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, you have to make a biomarker-based diagnosis, which is inaccessible to most of our patients. We are working towards, I know the youngsters are all, I see Durjoy here who's done clinical trials. I know Fahim is working on plasma biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease. So we have the, what is called the ATN classification. It's a good idea to go through it, but still cognitive assessment is still part of it. <clears throat> Very quickly, I will go through a few cases and um, maybe, Fahim, do I have time? Yes, ma'am. You have time. Three minutes? Okay, I'll go through maybe yeah. three or four cases and then we can stop um, because this is never ending. So this is, a gen this is a very classical Alzheimer's disease. Older person, memory loss, forgetting events, wayfinding difficulty. So medial temporal, parietal, like problems recognizing close friends, Naming, so now language, 
father had some memory disturbances at 104 years so it's not probably genetic it's probably still sporadic there might be an apoe4 susceptibility or it may be completely sporadic and this is a patient with alzheimer's disease so you can see that he learned three words on the list recall later on he couldn't remember any of them he copied nicely but he could not remember what he had copied. So whatever he has learned, he is forgetting. Classical Alzheimer's disease, medial temporal lobe atrophy, medial temporal lobe hyp and parietal hypometabolism. You can see the whole brain is indeed atrophied, but the maximum brunt is here. In this patient, you may not require an FDG PET for diagnosis. So this is where you have to be prudent about using diagnosis. If a See, memory loss can also be due to other things. For instance, here... This person came with memory loss, but he was only forgetting names. But he remembered the event that his you know, son had come. So he's coding events, but he forgot names. So that will tell you, is naming problem a semantic memory problem? So when you ask him, are you happy? Patient will say, what is happy? That minute you know this is a conceptual problem. And none of these items he could name. He couldn't map the jackfruit to the seed. So then you know that this person, you can even predict this even before you see the scan that it's a left anterior inferior temporal atrophy and it is a semantic dementia. It's a variant of frontotemporal dementia. On the other hand is another person who also cannot name, he has loss of speech, but he also cannot name well. But when you ask him, show me the cat, show me the uh, rabbit, he points well. That means he has a concept, but he has forgotten how to provide the name. He can map the jackfruit to the uh, seed. He writes Sri Rama quite well. And this patient has concepts are good, but he is not able to speak. You have to localize this to the left frontal lobe. And here you can see it's a sylvian fissure has opened up, left frontal atrophy. And this is front, progressive non-fluent aphasia. So what I will do now is I will not present other cases for him because I think, uh, okay, just one case. So this patient had come with wayfinding difficulties. She was not able to place the vessels properly on the stub. So you can see it's all visuospatial apraxic. She couldn't identify these. She said those black, black things. I don't get them. So as I mentioned, you have to chunk them, her symptoms. Mainly she had visuospatial symptoms. Can you see? In your brain, this should happen. You should start chunking them. She had visuospatial problems. These symptoms suggest that she had memory problems. Attention was good. Social cognition good. No symptoms to suggest language. So this is what it is. Picking up the key symptom, visuospatial memory. The scan will also show prominent parietal hypo. Can you see here? There is no metabolism at all here. This is posterior cortical atrophy. I will quickly go to the last slide because I don't want to. Treatable causes, you should. Uh, this is one patient that I want to present because Dr. Kaul helped me present, make this diagnosis. This person said that he went to Chennai and he, he those days called Madras and we had a visa interview and he couldn't find his way back. Somehow over a few months he came back, but his wife said that he could not recognize his face, but she could, he could recognize her, her face, recognize her with the words. So there, this is a prosopognosia, posterior circulation stroke, and there you have to innovate, you have to show them faces of people you think they would have known before the disease. And this is a posterior circulation stroke. You should never miss a treatable dementia. And that is, I think, the, con the oh, you know, do we do autoimmune dementia, uh, encephalitis panel for all patients or not is a discussion we can have for later. But this is a patient with 18 months history of relapses of depression, then some behavioral disturbances, and then some memory disturbances. And then he was GAD antibody positive. Treatment was initiated. He improved. You can see the clock here. So much of perseveration. So you would think there's a frontotemporal dementia. In fact, he was referred to us by as a frontotemporal dementia. And he can't remember anything. Quite likely that he would have, would have been just left and sent home. He was a doctor. Seen by neurologists. 
This was also picked up. And you can see that antibodies were positive. You can see how beautifully the clock improved. You can see he remembered seven words, which he was not able to remember. So this is a this is our nightmare that we have missed a treatable cause. And because we are in a specialist clinic, we tend to over investigate a little more. Uh, but that is something that you will have to decide how much you want to do. But it's they account for about less than 5% of dementias. Maybe the number goes up with more data coming in. Always ask about the caregiver's experiences because... 50% of the time, the time you spend, please talk to the caregivers about themselves because any future management will only depend on how well they are, how much they have understood. Therefore, to summarize, we need to develop a cognitive profile with history and proper history and examination, localized cognitive impairment in the brain, derive etiology based on the temporal profile, acute, chronic, subacute, interview a reliable caregiver, persist, encourage, and understand the person's deficits, but don't recognize just disability, I recognize ability. You will know which areas of the brain are preserved, which you can later on use for rehab. Innovate when necessary, basically write the book, support the caregiver. And then it becomes an easy exercise. I would actually should have added, it's easy, it's not difficult, and it's also very rewarding. I'd like to thank all the people. Um, this is a completely team growth. And we hope that there are some of you in the audience who find this important to take up as a subspeciality. But I think we would like all of you to uh, participate in this. You know, it's a very exciting time, dementia in India, uh, because the numbers are going up and patients can be very great, grateful if you do the right job. So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Suvarna, for an uh, excellent lecture. Whosoever has uh, listened to this lecture probably will understand that cognition is not that difficult. And if you have the fascination, you can pursue your career in the field of neurology in this country. There are many young and energetic neurologists who are now in the faculty in many of the institutes, so you can get trained and uh, there are few questions in the chat box so one of them is uh, regarding your case the last case which you uh, presented uh, why did you suspect cat 65 in this patient any red flag madam okay, i'll see if i can show that slide one sec that it's master class huh? They, they, it's very important. If I hear you want to take this out, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you it. There were some things. Uh, sure. <clears throat> One second. So basically, this patient has had fluctuations in uh, their symptoms. And then uh, the, the, the total duration of illness was just one year. It was rapidly progressive. So that's why we are expecting some autoimmune uh, encephalitis panel to be positive. And that's why we went ahead with the uh, these tests. So, yeah, and subsequently you saw how much improvement was there. So, it proved, obviously, the uh, patient didn't have any uh, other features to suggest autoimmune encephalitis, but these were some of the red flags, so, which would help us in uh, making a diagnosis. It looked like an FTD, as Madam said, but then I think we should always rule out a treatable cause before uh, labeling them as having a degenerative illness. So, can you see this slide? Yes, yes. So, these were the reasons. So, we went back to the history. Um, so, so you can see inattention, forgetfulness, disorganized, disinhibition, overfamiliarity, referral diagnosis. And then we went back. It's a short history, six months. Severe anxiety, panic, sleep yeah. disturbances. So this, I think, short history, some fluctuations, I think, you, and uh, then the GAD antibody was positive. Very good. Uh, so it was a <clears throat> short history and there was fluctuation. There are some symptom that points towards uh, uh, different diagnosis other than a degenerative disease. So that pointed towards uh, investigation, further investigation to find out the treatable cause. 
Dr. Atta, no, one question, sorry. One, Dr. Ram is asking, should we do autoimmune panel? I want to direct the question to a cognitive neurologist who is a, also a very good general neurologist. Dr. Carl, are you there? Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is something that we always discuss. Should we do autoimmune panel and paraneoplastic panel in all cases? As I said, as a referral center, we are tending to do them knowing that, but they're not expensive in our center. They're, they're not at all expensive in demands and we do only a short panel. Dr. Carl, can you, do you want to give your thoughts on? You know, my, yeah, my, my thoughts is exactly what you said. If it's a, if it's a acute to subacute dementia, you know, if we are sure that, and I would draw that line at about six months. If within six months a person is having, then uh, probably I will go for it. But if I get a patient who is more than more than a year and uh, very gradually progressive, it also depends upon the, you know, these days our patient population is quite heterogeneous. One of the problems why we don't do, they're very expensive. You know, just to ask somebody to do a pet means another 25,000 rupees. So I would decide it on a case-to-case -case basis. I would not do it in each and every patient as of now. So now I have asked you the same question so many times. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I think, Atanu, why don't we have a balanced approach from you? What do you do? Do you do in all? The question no, is, do you do in all dementias uh, 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 PET scan? No, sir. Uh, unless, of course, there is a red flag or there is a suspicion. Uh, yes, when there is subacute progressive disease and uh, we suspect that there might be a something treatable cause, then only we sus subject them to autoimmune panel or panel plastic. Yeah. And not all patients who are having degenerative disease to Slowly progressive disease will not subject them. Sir. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for your comments. And of course, uh, a big thank to Dr. Suvarna for giving an excellent lecture. I now request Dr. Uh, Dr. Fahim to begin the next part of our webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, sir, and thank you very much, Swanaman, for that uh, fantastic talk, as always. So let's move to the case presentation now, and it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, next uh, speaker, uh, my friend and enthusiastic colleague, Dr. Atri Chatterjee. Dr. Atri, uh, he has done his neurology residency at uh, Neelotan Sarkar Medical College, Kolkata, and he's done his fellowship training in behavioral neurology and dementia at University of uh, British Columbia in Canada. Currently, he is the assistant professor and in charge Cognitive and Behavior Neurology Clinic, Department of Neurology, Vardhamin Mahavir Medical College, New Delhi. And his main research interest areas are in early onset dementia, dementia genetics, and BPSD. So he'll be moderating the next case presentation. And uh, the case will be presented by Dr. Ankur Abita Arvin. Dr. Ankur has done his MBBS from GMC Rajkot. He has done his MD from GMC Bhavnagar. And currently, he is the senior resident in the Department of Neurology, Vardhamin Mahavir Medical College at Southern Hospital New Delhi with uh, Dr. Atri. And this uh, in this session, we'll have chairpersons, Dr. Atanu, sir, and Dr. Subhash Kohl, sir. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Atri, for the moderation, and uh, Dr. Ankur. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fahim. So it's my pleasure to uh, present a case from our clinic in this inaugural uh, webinar of the Cognitive Neurology subsection. Uh, I'll, before we start, I'll just make two short points. One is... Um, Many of our patients, a large proportion of our patients are actually early onset dementia. These patients are still in their working age. They have families to support, which practically adds to the tragedy of dementia, the human tragedy of dementia. So, and the percentage seems to be much higher in, in our population compared to the cohorts uh, in the Western population. And uh, secondly, uh, something that we'll see with this case is that the cognitive disorders in a single patient will continue to evolve and uh, it's important to repeatedly examine the patient over the course of the disease and the diagnosis may change over time. The diagnosis may not be as apparent at baseline and as we continue to see the patient over months or years, uh, new features will uh, help us diagnose and uh, new challenges to management will also arise. Uh, so with these two points, I'll uh, request Dr. Ankur to start. Uh, Dr. Ankur, please. Oh. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my screen is visible. No, uh, not your screen, Ankur. Oh, sorry, sir. Share your screen. Okay, just a minute. 
Yeah. Yes, sir. Now it is visible. We can see now. Okay. Uh, very pleasant. Good morning to all of you. At first, I would like to convey my regards to chairpersons, uh, the convener, Dr. Fahim sir, organizers, and the entire cognitive neurology subsection of Indian Academy of Neurology for providing me an opportunity to present my case on this platform. The title of my presentation is The Dis-Execution Paradox Chasing the Chameleon. I'm uh, presenting the case of a 53-year-old right-handed a graduate gentleman. He was working as a shopkeeper and runs a small provisional store outside his house. His past medical history was significant for hypertension for four years and has a history of ischemic stroke four years prior to the onset of symptoms. He was accompanied by his wife and son who provided useful collateral information. He presented to us with chief complaint of difficulty in judgment and managing finances for one year and difficulty in reading, writing, and conversation for one year. Coming to history of presenting illness, the patient was relatively asymptomatic one year back when he was running a small uh, provision store outside his house. Uh, he was managing his shop all by himself and would, was assisted by his wife in some of the manual books. His wife first noticed that he was having difficulty in managing inventories. He was unaware of his stocks at the shop and would buy stocks which were already in surplus and forget to buy the stocks which were not there. Also, he was unable to plan uh, regarding the stocks for seasonal events such as Makar Sakranti at that time. He also had difficulty in managing orders from customers. For example, if there were two customers simultaneously at the shop, he would mix up the orders given by them and uh, mix up their articles. Or suppose a customer provided a long list of art items, he was not able to track their orders and has also difficulty in finding articles in the shop. He was also, uh, give, uh, there was also problem with uh, uh, returning of money as he would sometimes uh, give extra money or sometimes would uh, return less amount of money. He was also uh, difficulty in managing the finances of the shop and due to recurring loss at the shop, they started to shut down the shop 10 months back. In an incident uh, that occurred 10 months back, he was unable to repair his hand pump, which he was initially able to do. And also he had difficulty in writing the, doing the paperwork at the bank, which he was previously able to do without any much effort. Uh, uh, simultaneously, his wife also noticed there were multiple mistakes while writing in his stock book of the uh, shop. Uh, there were multiple spelling uh, errors and he was using unusual use of words. For example, he was uh, there was a neighbor and he's also customer, Kamal. He wrote his name in a several ways in the his stock book. And these mistakes were not limited to him, but he was uh, continuously repeating these mistakes for all other customers also. His wife also noticed while reading newspaper, he was not reading the full sentences. Uh, in spite of reading the full uh, sentences, what he was doing, he was just reading one sentence and was repeating during the reading. She also noticed that uh, while conversation, he was not able to uh, find exact words and he was looking for the words. He uses the gestures to complete his sentences sometimes. Uh, six months into the illness, when one has tried to write a uh, bank check, he was unable to write down his name and date for the check. Also, during the conversation with his son who was residing in Delhi on the telephone, uh, he was uh, his son noticed that he was not able to understand what was being said to him. And uh, what he was doing, uh, what the son was telling, he, he would pick one or two words and continues to repeat them. Uh, in the further few months, there was gradual decline in speech output as he was uh, telling more and more less words. And uh, he has also difficulty in naming the ho common household objects as well as the name of the family members. 
he would uh, he would call his son by different names at different times or sometimes would uh, remain silent uh, he uh, moreover used the gestures to communicate but for the last 3 months he wasn't able to use the gestures to communicate uh, with these major complaints he consulted on further questioning his wife manarets a story when he uh, he lost his way uh, back from his farm 8 months ago uh, when was he was returning from his farm he was uh, found confused at the roads he was seen by the fellow village members and was escorted to his village <laughs> however there was no history of being lost in his uh, house as he was able to locate his washroom and uh, kitchen uh, with his and his room also uh, the family member also noticed he withdraw himself from all social interaction with his fellow villagers as well as uh, the family members and preferred to lie at the same position he would not ask for food and eat whatever whatsoever is served to him without any further questioning initially he used to uh, tell about the preferences what he would like to eat but he stopped doing so he would sit in front of tv for hours without expressing any particular preference for any particular program he would watch all the programs without properly for, uh, following it uh, he could uh, when prompted he would go to the shower after which there was a sense of he was not able to dress up properly and he would wear the clothes upside down and uh, after this has happened uh, since last 6 months and for that time his wife helps uh, him to assist him in dressing he also has forgot uh, regarding the recent events for last 3 to 4 months that uh, whom he has met what he has eaten he does not remember these things also has forget regarding the important dates of his life he doesn't ask about his farm shop or relatives Uh, Doctor Ku, the screen share switch was switched off. You can you have to reshare the screen. Okay. Uh, my screen is visible, sir. No, oh. not yet. Just a minute. Yes. Okay. uh the family member denied for any history of any socially inappropriate behavior or repetitive behavior any fluctuation in his symptoms or any sleep related problems uh he has stopped his uh, instrumental activities of daily living uh, 10 months back he feed himself if food is served to him but is unable to dress and requires prompts to shower uses the toilet independently his past medical history is significant for hypertension For four years, he had a history of ischemic stroke four years back with left-sided weakness, which recovered in a span of uh, three months uh, with a partial recovery. And he has recently been diagnosed with ischemic heart disease. He does not endorse any addiction or any allergies. His social history: he is a farmer uh, who used to supervise his farms initially, but after the event of stroke, he uh, opened a shop. and he was working as a shopkeeper lives with, in his village with uh, his wife his son in uh, lives in delhi who visit him in every 3 to 4 month he uh, he used to watch television read religious books in his free time but he has stopped doing in the past year the family history is unremarkable uh, on reviewing the other symptoms uh, the vision and hearing appears to be normal there was normal sleep and appetite he does not have any pain no involuntary movement slowness stiffness uh, he was able to walk properly gait and balance was normal he was continent with bladder and bowel and there was no any systemic signs such as shortness of breath or chest pain present uh, summarizing the case is a 53 year old right handed gentleman with significant past medical history of 
hypertension, stroke, and ischemic heart disease, presented with progressive cognitive decline for one year. The symptoms started with executive dysfunction in form of attention deficits, difficulty planning, and poor judgment. His family member simultaneously noted progressive language impairment, starting from word finding difficulty and progress to loss of comprehension, reading and writing in six months. He later developed navigational issues, autobiographic and semantic memory loss with apathy and dressing apraxia. He lost his instrumental activities of daily living 10 months back and is dependent on family members for some of his basic activities of daily living. At present, he can take feet on himself and use toilet. He does not have any prominent weakness or any Parkinsonian symptom. There were no history of trauma, fever, or any systemic complaints prior to the onset of illness. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uncle. So we will uh, take a pause here and uh, first discuss the history before going on to the examination. Uh, I would like to uh, ask our uh, senior faculties, uh, sir, madam, uh, your questions and comments. And if any of the audience, you, if you have uh, any questions or comments, please put it in the chat box. Um, we'll try to address as many questions as possible. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, <clears throat> for a uh, very interesting patient, young patient, relatively 53 years old, with so much vascular risk factors having a stroke in the past and also for ischemic heart disease. But the patient presented with a very rapid progression. Over the last one year period, he has become totally de uh, dependent on caregiver with a sequential involvement of different cognitive domains, starting from the frontal executive dysfunction, then affecting the uh, visuospatial function, language, praxis, so sparing maybe one or two domains. Memory is not that much affected, I think, from the history. So he is uh, demented and uh, dementia is uh, very rapid in progression. Of course, uh, as we are discussing in the last case, in these patients, we have to find out any treatable cause. We have to find First, to go into the detailed examination, whether the, these domains are affected or any other domains is also affected. And whether there is any, any vascular uh, signature, particularly if there is any, any motor problem, any, although he is denying any spinal problem, but any um, that suggests any vascular pathology. But I would rather think of uh, treatable autoimmune and other factors first before stamping it to a uh, degenerative disease. If it is degenerative at all, then the disease started in the executive problem, then progress to involve the posterior aspects, language and the visual spatial praxis. So it is uh, not a very typical of frontotemporal dementia, not having any typical behavior of frontotemporal dementia in these patients. But an uh, executive dysfunction, uh, if it is degenerative, then of course a variety of uh, atypical variety of Alzheimer's, which may come as first presentation as executive dysfunction, like this executive Alzheimer's could be another uh, possibility in, uh, if it is degenerative at all. But first, I would like to exclude any treatable cause uh, during the imaging and also carrying out some other investigations, including. Of course, in this patient's uh, autoimmune profile. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I agree with uh, Atanu. Um, definitely, the first uh, thing which comes to our mind is the uh, loss of executive functions, because that has been very nicely told him how he was. It basically affected his business. He was not able to execute, and how we lost this piece by piece. Uh, eventually, he got definitely uh, other domains also were affected. Memory was affected eventually, and there was clear-cut dressing apraxia. So something which started from execution eventually spread to other things. So the first thing which comes to the mind is whether it is all vascular, because there is a strong vascular background. Um, he had a stroke, uh, and now he has a ischemic heart disease. 
But one thing we have to remember is that vascular causes, when they cause this execution, that is uh, because of subcortical frontal lobe involvement, you know, what's called subcortical leukoencephalopathy. Usually it is associated with gait disturbances, Parkinsonian gait, lower. We did not get any clue towards that in this patient. So there is no subcortical involvement as from the history. So examination findings are very important. And second is imaging is very important in these patients. I'd be very uh, particular to look at the images, whether there are any white matter changes, uh, you know, periventricular white matter changes I'd like to see. So even though he has got a vascular background, uh, the uh, presentation does not, the presentation of this uh, cognitive syndrome does not seem to be typically vascular. There is no step-by-step -step progression and there is no gait disturbances. Uh, so I would I would consider it, but put it lower down on the list. So I would uh, think that it is probably we are dealing with some kind of a degenerative disease only, which is uh, probably a chameleon here. And what it is, I think the investigations are going to show. Yeah. Uh, Madam, uh, your input. And I, I, I agree. Uh, I agree with uh, what Dr. Ratanu and Dr. Call have said. And I think executive dysfunction is always, at the history level, I find it difficult to zero in on that. So I'm, and I think that is something that in this patient that has been brought out well. For me, vascular would still be a possibility because he's had a stroke, he has hypertension, and or maybe mixed kind of why not all strokes develop so much of cognitive impairment, right? But uh, uh, why does uh, why uh, why is it that he had a stroke? Maybe it's a mixed pathology. That's the other possibility that he had a stroke. It's unmasked something, and that's why he's presenting atypically. Maybe. Yeah, so the, uh, one point I want to make, I think you brought forth a very important point. And I think that uh, I should have said that point, what you said, uh, because that is so important that, uh, you know, most of the times, many times, they, they, it's a combined pathology. It's a combined. In Alzheimer's, 50% of them have got an underlying vascular etiology. So we compartmentalize it, that this is this, this is this. That probably happens only in autoimmune. Yeah. But short of autoimmune in Alzheimer's disease, in frontotemporal dementia, in many of them, almost 40% of them, there is an associated vascular pathology which contributes to the clinical presentation, which unmasks it. So it may be well mixed, as you rightly said. Yeah. But I would like to look at the MRI. And the PET amyloid, and the tau yeah. amyloid, and yeah. the cytokine, and anti yeah. So we are looking at that yeah. next. We'll have six-pan play you know, panels here of different, different pathologies sometime in the future. Uh, Dr. Fahim, would you like to add? No, Anything? I completely agree with what uh, Anusar calls her and uh, Ma'am said. Just to add one point, see, uh, the handedness of the patient is very important. Here we casually yeah. tend to see, okay, patient is right-handed. Because we recently had one patient, he said right-handed, but we did his Edinburgh inventory. He turned out to be ambidextrous. And that patient had a right-side lesion and he had a non-fluid interfacia. So we don't know what to call that patient. I mean, Edinburgh inventory ideally sometimes should be done if you have a previous history of stroke and just now one year history of uh, these difficulties. So the history of prior any TIAs, uh, I think that should be asked because again, one year history is very short. So we don't know it's degenerative. I agree, it could be degenerative as well. But before labeling as degenerative, we should still think of a treatable cause. Vascular obviously high, would be high on cards, but I think atypical Alzheimer's would be a second possibility, I think. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, so for us, uh, one of the uh, dilemmas was uh, that uh, this is within a year, the patient is now very, very dependent. So do we call this a rapidly progressive dementia or do we not call this a rapidly progressive dementia? Uh, by two to three months of uh, onset of symptoms, the patient has already lost his livelihood. Uh, the other side, so technically, if we just take that history at face value, this becomes rapidly progressive dementia. On the other hand, uh, we are not even sure that whether the minor or the milder symptoms were observed by the family, uh, with, they are not that aware of uh, minor errors. So the actual timeline may, ha may have been longer. So this is a dilemma that I guess everyone has to deal with. Uh, do we take the on duration of the symptoms at face value or 
we try to dig up uh, incidents that happened even farther back, which would point us that this is a more chronic disease. But if we cannot, so obviously we have to look for uh, that spectrum of disease. The other point is this being a relatively young patient, also uh, rarer causes uh, come into play. Uh, rarer presentations of common neurodegenerative diseases as well as rarer causes of uh, dementia. They are uh, in the differential diagnosis. And uh, thirdly, another uh, one point that I felt uh, is uh, illustrative in this history is we generally try to uh, compartmentalize the symptoms for our convenience into memory, attention, uh, executive function. But as Manam showed in a performance-based history, something like uh, difficulties in managing a shock. So almost all the cognitive domains are involved in managing uh, managing a shop. So that is a, like a real world example of uh, multiple deficits interacting with each other. And uh, we can ask for a description from the, from the patient or the family that what are the problems that you are facing in the shop or during cooking or during grocery shopping, and then parse them out into specific domains, whether this part is due to this, uh, this domain, that part is due to that domain. But in real world, they are actually impinging the patient's life all together. So uh, with this, uh, we'll move on and we'll try to analyze the case. Uh, Dr. Onku, let's, let's uh, share the screen and let's move on to the next section. Okay. The screen is visible? Yeah. Yes. So we first tried to analyze the symptoms. Uh, we would... Uh, the two major initial symptoms were uh, the loss of executive function and uh, secondly, the language domain. So we tried to uh, anatomically localize the uh, involvement of executive function through the, the neural circuitry of from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to the uh, striatum, uh, to the thalamus and to the back to the frontal lobe and the language domain through the uh, complex language network. Uh, uh, as uh, already have been discussed, due to a very short period of illness, uh, the possibility of reversible causes uh, were tried to be eliminated. But again, uh, as Sir said, has Sir has said that uh, the exact timeline may not be uh, actual to the, what the patient has told. And uh, second, uh, there was a piling up of, of the symptom. One symptom was present; uh, another symptom added to it. So uh, we uh, thought of the possibility of a neurodegenerative disorder also. Uh, so uh, we put uh, it as a dis-executive syndrome. Uh, probably the pathology would be Alzheimer's disease versus FTD versus as there was a prominent vascular risk factor. So we keep the possibility of vascular risk factor and uh, the progressive aphasia part, which will be either, uh, which is more looking like a secondary to a neurodegenerative causes rather than a primary progressive aphasia. Uh, so coming to the uh, examination part, in the general examination, patient was conscious. There was no signs of distress noted. The vitals were stable. There were no pallor, icterus, cyanosis, edema, or clubbing was seen uh, in the respiratory system and the cardiovascular examination was normal and there was no palpable organomegaly. Coming to the cognitive examination, we started with the mental state examination. Uh, patient was calm, cooperative. He was oriented to person, but disoriented to time and place. He appears appropriate for ACE. The eye-to-eye -eye contact was made, but not maintained. The, flat, uh, the effect appears to be flat with restrictive range and reactivity. There was paucity of thought content. But again, there was a significant language impairment, which may be a confounding factor in this. And there was no delusion or hallucination noted. So we started with more of cognitive examination. We started with the screening test. We did MMSC, uh, MOCA and FAB. So the score of MMSC was 5 out of 30. MOCA was 3 out of 30 and FAB was 3 out of 18. Uh, in many mental status examination, uh, he lost all, he get only three points, one point in registration and uh, two points in uh, naming of pencil and watch and uh, uh, three stage command, he scored two points. 
So total score by five out of thirty. Uh, he lost all the points in orientation, in attention and calculation, and he was not able to read and write. And uh, when we asked him to uh, copy this design, uh, he initially tried to overwrite on the design, and then he make some di uh, some lines only. In the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, uh, he scored three out of thirty. He was able able to name the two animals out of three, and he was able to name the place. In the rest of examination, he was not able to answer. In the frontal assessment battery, he was uh, he got only three points of uh, lack of prehension behavior. Otherwise, he was uh, not able to score a point. Uh, going to the detailed cognitive examination, we started with the attention. The forward digit span was up to two digits. Uh, he was not able to remember anything. So backward digit span was zero. Vigilance, we checked with a uh, tap a test that was impaired. There was more than two to three errors of commission and uh, omission. Uh, checking for the language domain, we started with the spontaneous speech. There was decreased word output, frequent word finding pauses. There was paraphasias and neologisms present. The paraphasias were both semantic and phonemic, but articulation was normal. Coming to comprehension, the single word comprehension, which was tested by using pointing commands, was normal. Comprehension to one step command was preserved, and but comprehension to absurd questions were impaired. Uh, we asked him some absurd question like uh, whether the sky is red or whether a cat flies. He was unable to answer them. And naming was impaired for objects, colors, and body parts. But he was able to point to the objects, but he was not able to name them. Uh, repetition for single word repetition was preserved, but sentence repetition was impaired. The reading and writing was impaired. In the memory examination, uh, we gave him five words to register. Uh, out of, after two attempts, he was unable to register a single word. So recall and cute recall was not testable. In the autobiographical memory, we asked for recent and remote event that he wasn't able to answer. In the semantic memory and non-verbal non memory, it was untestable as he was not able to uh, completely understand the instructions given to him. In the executive function assessment, we asked him to name uh, the animals in one minute. Uh, he did give one animal in one minute. When we asked him to uh, uh, tell the words from the letter ka, he wasn't able to name any of them. In the Luria testing, there was perseveration noted in both motor and graphical Luria test. And as he was not able to understand the instructions properly, he was not able to do go no go test and trail A and trail B. Similarly, for the similarities, he wasn't able to understand what was being said to him. So uh, we give him three spirals to copy it down. Uh, instead of copying, he tried to uh, write on them and there was perseveration noted. Similarly, for the graphical Luria, there was a single uh, perseveration was noted for it also. Uh, for the individual spatial functions, there was no neglect noted. Uh, there was no color agnosia, but color anomia was there. Construction was impaired. Block drawing was severely impaired. And uh, simultagnosia was untestable. But we did not find any evidence of valiance, Justman syndrome. And when we asked him to copy the circle, uh, the patient uh, tried to copy the circle and uh, perseveration was noted. He was able to copy the triangle. Not exactly, but it was a triangle. Um, but wasn't able to cobble the uh, cross. In the praxis examination, he was able to pantomime the use of toothbrush and was able to salute. He was able to select tools correctly for action. Uh, we show him the picture of nail and ask him which uh, tool he will select. Uh, he was able to uh, select hammer for it. But when we ask him for alternate uh, tool selection, he, he does not uh, choose for spanner. Instead of it, he chose for brush. There was evidence of ideational apraxia as he was not able to tell how he would mail a letter. There was no limb kinetic or buccofacial apraxia. Calculation was imp severely impaired as he could not do simple verbal calculations. Coming to the neurological examination, the cranial nerve examinations were normal. In the motor examination, the bulk was normal. The tone was normal. Power was uh, normal except for 4 by 5 around left hip and shoulder. 
in the reflexes. Uh, deep tendon reflexes was bilateral, symmetrical, and normal. Uh, plantar reflex was bilateral flexor, and there was no primitive reflexes was seen. In the sensory examination, there was no apparent abnormality. There was no cerebellar signs, and uh, he was able to walk normally. The gait and balance was also normal. So uh, we pause again uh, for another round of discussion. So after the history, we were considering uh, rapid causes of rapidly progressive dementia, and including autoimmune disorder. And we considered vascular cognitive impairment, and we also con considered atypical presentation of Alzheimer's disease, which is also rapidly progressing, which is common in the younger patients. So again, uh, uh, I'll request. Uh, our teachers to uh, for their views and any clarifications uh, that that we should have done but we haven't done so anything that we have missed. Sir, you are Atno, on your mic. Atno, on your mic. Yes, sir. First of all, uh, we could not demonstrate any motor features in this patient. There was no not even uh, pyramidal or extrapyramidal sign. And the gait was absolutely normal. There was uh, no sphincter dysfunction as well. As Professor Call was talking about, if it had it been a subcortical dysfunction or subcortical vascular dysfunction, we would have expected some amount of motor dysfunction, sphincter dysfunction in this patient, which is lacking. So probably, the, although he was having a strong vascular risk factor and, and a history of stroke in the past, this pathology which he's having at the moment is not uh, vascular, in nature. It may be something different, either degenerative or as it is a very rapidly progressive. If the patient has become so disabled, the scoring only 5 out of 30 in MMSC or MOCA in just one year period of time, we must consider this as a, we must, uh, consider this as a rapidly progressive dementia. Somebody in the chat box has wrote, uh, uh, wrote about uh, what is uh, whether there was any myoclonus or not. And of course, uh, sorry, another person who has wrote, who has written that whether we'll call it a dis-executive because a patient is having so much of other cognitive domains uh, affected in these patients. Yes, it is now the patient is having a, a full-blown dementia uh, syndrome. He is having uh, deficits in other domains as well, but his primary symptoms started with the executive dysfunction as from the history itself. That's why the uh, the presenter and of course Dr. Othri has given the title as this executive syndrome. Uh, in the due course of time, any patient whosoever is coming with a memory problem, uh, we uh, stamp, uh, call them amnestic syndrome, but yes, in due course of time, they also develop some other cognitive deficits. Nobody, no patients remain in the in the amnestic syndrome uh, localized to the memory problem itself. Similarly, this is this executive syndrome. This patient started with the executive dysfunction the very early, and then of course other domains also gets affected. So uh, that is probably my explanation for why Dr. Othri has stamped it to be this executive syndrome. So I would again consider a rapidly progressive dementia. I would try to exclude the treatable causes first. Then we'll uh, level it to a degenerative dementia. It may be some form of uh, either frontal variant of the AD, a rapid, uh, uh, the atypical AD, which sometimes begin very early in, uh, in life and also we progress rapidly. Sir, Professor Call, please. So, uh, yeah, Atanu, completely agree with you. Uh, in any of these cases, we have to catch the keynote. We have to catch something from where we can build up our uh, argument and our uh, supposition. So here, I think execution is the main thing. He's a shopkeeper and he could not execute day-to-day -day things. Other things came later. For initial few months, it was only he was not able to do, uh, execute. And even at that stage, he was... Initial part, his memory was all right. So it's a it's a dis-executive syndrome for sure to begin with. Eventually, they all get mixed and everything comes there. But there is absolutely no gait disturbance. There's no pyramidal signs, which is quite striking. So as a primary vascular cognitive impairment, I would not give my vote. 
here because vascular cause, you know, rarely anything can happen. That's a different thing. But generally, we will not call it a vascular because vascular cognitive impairment uh, as a full-fledged syndrome should have some um, gait abnormalities or some rigidity and something which is not there. So that will be low on the cards, if not completely out. That may be contributing in its pathophysiology, but that would not be the predominant thing, even though the patient is having a history of stroke. So then what is the possibility? I think my first possibility would be uh, definitely a degenerative uh, disease, like a frontotemporal dementia or a typical Alzheimer's. And uh, as one of the speakers said, that even though we are thinking it is one year, there might have been some subtle changes before also, which might not have been brought to the notice of the attendants. So I would put my money first on the degenerative thing. Now, among the degenerative, one question comes, can it be CJD? You see, if it is a CJD, it has to be a, a typical CJD. If it's a typical CJD, we don't have myoclonus here. And if it's a atypical CJD, we don't have ataxia here. So in the absence of ataxia and in the absence of myoclonus, in the absence of any visual disturbances, I, I will rule out CJD. So it is either frontotemporal dementia, atypical Alzheimer's. Now, the question is the most important million dollar question, treatable, we are saying all the time. Is it autoimmune encephalitis? I'm sure if he goes to Nimhans, he will get a PET scan done. You know, for autoimmune encephalitis, right from the beginning, when we studied autoimmune encephalitis, we wanted some constellation of symptoms. I would love to have seizures in this patient to say autoimmune, either temporal lobe seizures or extratemporal seizures. I would like to have fluctuations in this patient. There are none in these patients. So only for the sake of exclusion and treatable thing, which we always say, I would like to keep that as a differential diagnosis. But I would stick my neck out and go to the degenerative. And with that, I rest my case to Swarna or Fahim. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't look at the investigations or the MRI. So I'm feeling at a decided disadvantage here. But I sent a message, but Fahim hasn't responded. But... No, the thing is, I agree. It he has started atypically with, and I generally don't like to make a diagnosis of executive dysfunction and history. Uh, but in this patient, it did appear that you know all other domains were preserved, and there is some executive dysfunction. What is I think striking in the examination to me is that his memory was significantly impaired. Is that right, uh, uh, Abhina, Ankur? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, in the during examination, the memory part was significantly, but uh, there was, ma'am, uh, because uh, language was also impaired, so we uh, could not say that whether he was understanding everything or he wasn't. But so I was saw a... the slide on M language, it was relatively okay, right? It was not so impaired. If you look at the tests of language, the language was not so impaired. It was not like an aphasia. Um, uh, did you, do you want to look at the because I'll tell you why. Um, it started one is where it started is important, but then where did it spread? If it went into becoming a memory disorder, then we have to think of a atypical variant, but of an amnestic disorder. So the we we looked at hundred brains of people with atypical dementias in life when I was in Cambridge and. None of them had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in life, but the pathology was Alzheimer's disease. So they could be language, could start in the parietal lobes, visuospatial, very rarely frontal. Again, that's not a diagnosis that we typically make, but eventually they will have memory loss. So if this person had significant amnesia somewhere during the course with relative preservation of motor language, then maybe the patient has an you know AD type disease eventually, but the course is very rapid. It's one year, and uh, so I think an atypical variant of a neurodegenerative. Not it's not looking like frontotemporal dementia. Um, so an atypical variant of a neurodegenerative disease, I would still consider. Uh, Swarna, Swarna, can I ask? Can I ask one question for the sake of discussion? Yes. Please. As far as his age is concerned. It is less, uh, he's 53 and he has started at the age of 52. That plus uh, this, this execution, would that not 
favor more of FTD compared to atypical Alzheimer's. Just I'm learning from you. I'm, I'm not contesting what you said, but I just want to learn. I'm, the, the two points I'm saying, less age and predominant execution, eventually which became memory. So how do we analyze? I mean, how do we think about it? Good, sir. Good. This is, this is uh, often one of the frontal involvement does not equate to a frontotemporal dimension. Okay, 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 okay. FTDs are a unique group of disorders. They're unusual. Yes, they occur in young age, but they're so, you know, they have disinhibition, food fadism, some personality okay. change. Behavior gets affected in them. Okay. They become a little odd. So you can actually pick up a frontotemporal dementia behavioral variant. Okay. And that is usually associated with executive dysfunction. So okay. if the frontal lobe in FTD is affected, you don't get pure... Mm -hmm. You, it, you can get it in the initial phases. For many mm -hmm. years, they become a little disorganized, inattentive, but they'll still have some funny behaviors that they will carry chocolates in their bag. Yeah, which you didn't have, correct? Didn't have. That's mm -hmm. the only reason I'm not considering. But the age of onset is again very unusual for AD. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fahim, would you like to add? Yeah, uh, I think I'll why not FTD? Because behavior is always forefront in FTD. The number of patients which we have seen, I mean, it just comes like that. But here, if you see, there's no nothing behavior. It's mainly fine executive dysfunction and then language. I think language is coming at the forefront. So mainly our, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Call said, we had to focus on this language. I still feel there's something in language which we can get here. And as I feel it's an atypical variant and some part of language is definitely involved. No, Fahim. And, no, Fahim. Yes, the fact that their language is affected, aphasia is there. Wouldn't that again go in favor of uh, FTD? Sir, but but in, there is a language variant in Alzheimer's as well. Okay. So that that's the that's the catch here, sir. Because there's an entity logopenic variant, mm. and that has an AD pathology. But okay. the point here is again the things are there's something that again is logopenic also. They're fitting mm. in semantic variant. So this is kind of an overlap. The language features are not typically fitting here. So, I mean, this is not a straightforward case. It's a very interesting case. But, yeah, so I think imaging will tell us. If at all PET has been done, that will give us more information. Yeah. So, I, I would put my uh, my diagnosis on maybe atypical AD. But somewhere it has to be some language variant, if at all it is involved. See, we do not have any uh, amyloid markers or tau markers or biomarkers or anything else. But uh, clinical, this is our clinical and maybe uh, imaging supported diagnosis, if at all once we see the imaging. Yeah. Uh, so I'll uh, present our uh, problems and dilemmas during management of this patient. So one of the very important real-world problems is uh, how much resource do we deploy to rule out uh, causes of rapidly progressive dementia and autoimmune disorder? Because in India, it's always a choice. You get MRI, now you are left with either PET or an autoimmune encephalitis panel. Very rarely there is enough resource for everything. So same dilemma here. So my uh, line of thinking was that uh, from the history, we have executive dysfunction that is being corroborated with the examination. So there is nothing extra there, we accept. Language uh, impairment was there in the history. It's there in the examination. For me, uh, because so many things are impaired, now it's important to look at what is preserved at this stage. So uh, the patient is still able to speak in short sentences. And uh, these sentences, these shorter sentences sound normal. There is no uh, motor speech disorder. There is no speech apraxia. The, uh, the three things that I try to listen to is uh, uh, phonology, semantics, and syntax. So phonology, the articulation is normal, as we said. The words sound normal. Uh, semantics, if there were some semantic paraphrasia, but the more prominent thing was uh, word finding pauses. Someone being, as if not being lost in thought in the middle of a conversation. And the syntax, the word endings, the tense, uh, the plurals and the singulars appeared still relatively preserved, even though the patient is quite impaired. So, and uh, even in the testing, uh, despite having a very low score, naming appears to be relatively preserved. So, out of the three common syndromes of aphasia, uh, semantic variant is out and uh, looks to me more logopenic than non-fluent at this point of time. 
that coupled with a very prominent memory impairment uh, where he has lost uh, very important personal events which people lose at a very advanced age within a year he has lost the memory of his marriage the birth of his child the marriage of his uh, children and the marriage this happened the uh, marriage happened like only 3 4 years ago so very important personal landmarks already being lost so uh, now thinking was that unless in the basic set of examination or investigations if there is something uh, sprung uh, out which would not fit a neurodegenerative disorder then i am going to spend the patient's money or the patient has to spend money so you know, their own pocket money so then i'll deploy resources for evaluation of other autoimmunity ology but if it uh, if the investigation the basic investigation doesn't show anything unexpected or go with a neurodegenerative disorder then i'll start treating for a neurodegenerative disorder and see how the patient evolves if necessary we will do uh, you know they will save some money over next 2 3 months and do further investigation so that was my idea but at this point of time because uh, and we did some literature survey dr bangu is going to show us some literature survey there were some hints for me it looked like predominantly atypical alzheimer's disease um yes early onset which is in favor of atypical uh, alzheimer's disease rapid progression is also in favor of uh, atypical ad as we will we'll show a bit of literature now after the investigation so yeah so i guess we are now going over time so dr ankur please uh, please uh, show us the investigation and then we will uh, carry on the discussion Okay. Okay. Uh, so we started with the blood investigation. The blood investigations where complete blood count was normal. Renal function test, liver function test was normal. Vitamin B twelve was borderline below two thirty seven. The normal range was two hundred eleven to nine hundred eleven. But homocysteine was within the normal limit. TSH was raised nine point three, but free T three T four was normal. NTTP antibody was normal. Apart from that, we did for uh, serology for HIV, uh, which was also negative, and EEG was also negative. Coming to the MRI, uh, should I MRI show MRI in uh, radiant or? You can show the detailed T1. Uh, there is a thin section T1 axial, which I think would be more helpful. Yes. You can uh, move to uh, the uh, radiant. Just a minute. so you uh, i go at the top and then gradually come down or uh, yeah so at, yeah start here and gradually so bottom upwards we are going bottom upwards uh, in a thin section axial t1 yeah i think you can stop here slightly yes uh, so uh, yeah we are seeing predominantly medial temporal of atrophy uh, more prominent on the right side which is now possibly extending into the temporal neocortex more prominent on the right side uh, compared to the left side uh, dr ankur carry on carry on scrolling so uh, i think uh, i can stop here a bit yeah so uh, i felt that there was a slight asymmetry of the uh, atrophy it affected both anterior and posterior aspects on the right side and uh, but this patient was right handed and uh, possibly uh, slightly surprising compared to the uh, clinical uh, picture but uh, and the the atrophy pattern is not very clear cut in terms of temporoparietal versus uh, anterior atrophy i think there is both anterior atrophy as well as uh, the temporoparietal atrophy on the on the back but from who carry on scrolling
now we have more of uh, parietal and uh, atrophy. And I think you can show the axial flare uh, because uh, we didn't get any significant vascular changes. Uh, you scroll a bit. Oh. Yes, I, th I think we can leave it at that. So I think at this point of time, uh, the blood investigations uh, didn't give us any clue. Uh, there were uh, the neuroimaging shows atrophy suggestive of a neurodegenerative pathology, but it's uh, the pattern is not. It's the pattern is mixed. There is both anterior as well as uh, posterior atrophy. And there is prominent medial temporal lobe atrophy, which, is, which would correspond with the quite prominent memory loss. Right. Uh, Dr. Ungo, carry on, carry on. Let's move on to the literature because we are now 15 minutes over time. Okay. So uh, we look for the, after considering from the history, examination and the neuroimaging and the blood investigation, we had a strong possibility of uh, uh, probably the Alzheimer pathology. So we looked into the literature. So we found uh, that uh, there was a recent article from Donnelly RA, which was published in Brain Communist, which defined the progressive disexecutive syndrome, which it defined as a presence of persistent, predominant and progressive decline for over six months in any core executive cognitive function, which includes working memory, cognitive uh, flexibility and inhibition. This should be evident by the uh, subjective and as well as objective examination by the examiners. And there should be a probable exclusion criteria uh, in the form of uh, uh, ruling out any primary psychiatric, any uh, toxic inflammatory or metabolic causes. Uh, this can occur due to different pathology. If this executive syndrome is occurring due to Alzheimer pathology, for uh, possible that we need to have either CSF biomarker or an abnormal PET, amyloid PET. For a definitive one, we need, uh, apart from the uh, probable one, we need uh, increased CSF level of phosphorylated tau or uh, uh, we have uh, any autosomal mutation like PCN1, PCN2 and APP mutation or then autopsy consistent with Alzheimer's disease. So we further look into the different uh, uh, studies. So we come across the Osen Koppel uh, uh, article which was published in Brain where uh, they try to describe the clinical as well as uh, a patho clinical as well as a radiological finding of uh, different variants of uh, Alzheimer's disease and compare it with the typical Alzheimer's disease as well as behavioral variant of frontal temporal dementia. So in which they find that uh, for, uh, for uh, this executive predominant type, the age of onset was early onset, which was present in our patient. Uh, the first symptoms was executive dysfunction, which was also present. Uh, the episodic memory was relatively spared, which was uh, present in our initial part, but it has later on improved. The executive function was impaired. The behavior was mostly spared, as we have seen in our patient also. And in the atrophy pattern, there was predominantly temporoparietal cortex involvement. And when they compared the uh, imaging uh, of uh, this, uh, this executive presentation with uh, typical Alzheimer disease and behavioral FTD variant, the Alzheimer disease have usually the posterior dominant atrophy, while the behavioral FTD have predominant anterior in the frontal and temporal pole involvement. So this executive uh, variant showed the involvement of both frontal as well as uh, posterior involvement, which was also seen in our cases. Uh, the other possibility, uh, what from the study was known that uh, almost uh, 80 to 85% of cases of 
behavioral and this executive variant of AD has possible behavior of FTD. Our patient uh, also have the will fulfill the criteria of uh, be possible behavioral FTD as there was early apathy, loss of empathy, and uh, neuropsychological testing so executive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. We also considered for the possibility of VCI. Mm -hmm. Before that, we tried to compare with the different uh, uh, aphasias, which has been already been discussed by the executive members. And uh, we tried to revise the criteria for uh, vascular cognitive impairment. And uh, where we find that uh, there was evidence of dementia from the history as well as from the uh, neuropsychological neurological testing. But uh, the favor, the uh, vascular factor as a dominant factor for uh, dementia was not was we were not able to delineate it as uh, the uh, neuroimaging was not consistent with the particularly with the vascular involvement so that's all that is the my place and i want so, to so thank you for uh, the chat you are not audible, Dr. Atri. Some of your Atri, voice is breaking. breaking. Yeah. No, no, you are not audible at all. Dr. Atri, we cannot hear you. You are not audible. Hello, Dr. Atri? So long, Atri joins. Uh, there are few uh, uh, comments in the chat box. Uh, somebody wrote about that alternative to PET and sonal chitney resuscitation, whether we can use the ASL, which is a, a MRI based uh, test uh, to look into the, uh, the metabolism of the brain. So this is important and this is, of course, a very uh, good aspect uh, in the neuroimaging, but it's not available in all and not frequently used by the clinician in their routine practice. A PET is uh, widely used and although PET is costly, but ASL, uh, the arterial spin level keeping, is a good investigation to uh, get the correct information. I I hope uh, Dr. Subhana is there. She will, she will highlight this. You want my comments? Yes, yes. Overall or on that ASL? About ASL. Somebody I have not I have not used ASL, so I don't know, but I know that um, I would just do biomarkers in this patient. So ASL, you mean the radiology? I, I know, I know. Yeah, I think some people are doing it as a poor uh, substitute for PET scan. Yes. In St. John's, I was recently, and they are using ASL in their patients of dementia, thinking that it is perfusion. So if it, if PET is not available, it is. It, some people are using it off label as a as a replacement for PET. It will give some idea because it's perfusion based, but then it's very vascular basically. So uh, yeah. Dr. Atri. No, no, you are still not audible. So till Dr. Atri becomes audible, can I make one comment? Uh, great case, really. Uh, congratulations. I hope Dr. Atri is able to hear us at least if he's not able to speak. <laughs> you know, uh, it's a great case and how much there is to learn. And every time we see a case and Really, I mean, from tomorrow, I'll go with fresh energy to see again these patients of dementia. So, you know, we did a good job, basically, all of us, because all of us were sure that it is it is not a primarily vascular dementia. You know, even though we kept it because of the treatable, neurologists are so starved for treatments in centuries that we just want to say treatable, treatable. But we knew in the in the heart of our hearts, we knew that it does not look like a vascular. Similarly, the big success is none of us thought it's autoimmune, you know, because of the obvious reasons. So we were ruled out. Finally, we were stuck between only two, uh, either a typical Alzheimer's, I mean, I was, either a typical Alzheimer's, I mean, even CJD we ruled out. Finally, it was a typical Alzheimer's 
or FTD. But you know, always there has been a confusion between the amnestic variety of FTD versus behavioral uh, type of Alzheimer's. And that is finally where we come. But I'm very, uh, very happy that Suvarna and Fahim actually pinned that, no, this is indeed atypical Alzheimer's. So a lot to learn. Thank you very much. Yeah. Atno. So, just, uh, I'm sorry, am I audible? Yes, now you're yeah, audible. You're audible. Oh, yeah. so, uh, so our thought in this, so when we uh, surveyed the literature, it seems that from Amsterdam, a group has actually reported a, quite a long series of cases on frontal uh, and executive variant of AD with biomarker and autopsy uh, confirmation. And they have tried to parse out how do we settle this conundrum of you know, uh, memory problems in FTD and behavioral problems in AD. So the conclusion of that paper is that in the behavioral slash executive variant, the uh, memory is even worse compared to the typical AD, and it's far worse compared to the FTD patient. From the behavior perspective, this patient, the behavioral change is predominantly to apathy. There is almost never a disinhibition or compulsive behavior or hyperorality in this patient. And uh, the third point, what they have done is they have, uh, it's a research study, but they have tried to compare the impairment of the, the degree of impairment of executive function to the degree of impairment of uh, memory problems. And they have used some formulas, but what they have shown is if we kind of subtract the amount of executive dysfunction from the amount of memory problems. In FTD, the amount of memory problems will be lower. The amount of executive functions will be, uh, dysfunction will be higher. In typical AD, the amount of memory problems will be much higher. The amount of executive functions, dysfunction will be there, but almost comparable or less than the memory problem. And this particular variant that we are talking about is predominantly, uh, uh, there is both impairment of severe impairment of both. But the more severe impairment of memory is a clue and the relatively milder involvement of uh, behavior is also a clue. Now, there were some uh, questions and comments in the chat box. So I'm just going to just uh, address two, two of them. So one of them is about the testis of, testing of practice and presence of language impairment. So obviously it's taught that if the patient's language is impaired and comprehension is impaired, it's, uh, you should not comment on a practice, so which is accepted. But we should not discount if the, uh, what the patient can do. So if the patient is unable to perform a task, then it is difficult to comment whether this is due to language problems or not. But if the patient is able to perform some of the practice tasks, we do not just discount that and say that, you know, I'm not going to test practice at all because the patient has language problems. So we are trying to understand the maximum functioning of this human being rather than, uh, you know, stamping on what he cannot do. What he cannot do is important, but what he can do in real life is also very important. So we should still, still test for practice and try to understand what is the maximum amount of practice that is uh, that the patient can, and that will be very, very important in daily life. Number one. Number two, there are obviously some comments about whether due to the presence of other global impairment, uh, whether this, we should call this a uh, disexecutive syndrome. And we should, uh, because right now all the domains are involved. So again, my take is, uh, it depends on when you are seeing the patient. If we, if we had, if we had seen the patient six months ago, then possibly, uh, then this would have been a disactivity syndrome. So we are taking the history into account. And uh, there are corroborative examination findings to the history of onset. So that is why we are calling this back. Right? So at some point of time, all the domains will be involved. It's expected. So Dr. Ankur, from your uh, this literature uh, survey, predominant apathy would not be a feature of FTD probably. They should have some disinhibition also. Is that right? Have I understood it rightly? Uh, sir, predominant uh, apathy. Uh, predom no, sir. Basically, sir, so, uh, what have been uh, explained in that article, that uh, mm -hmm. the behavior part in uh, that uh, frontal variant of AD would have predominant apathy. And in FTD, uh, 
there would be a mode of disinhibition behavior. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Suman Madam has made a comment that it's possible that the vascular receptors are impinging onto the underlying neurodegenerative process, which is leading to the rapidly progress, rapid progress of the course. And I think which is it's very important. That is true. That is true because that is true because a uh, lot of the you know a, a person who has got a vascular etiology many times that vascular uh, hypoperfusion cannot be picked up on MRI. The fact that he has had a stroke means that there is a vascular disease, but it may be at a very very microscopic level, which may not even be picked up. You need a very seven Tesla MRI to pick it up. So there is clearly uh, that co comment is very tenable that there may be an underlying vascular thing, which is not being seen on MRI. Um, so with that, I guess we are almost at the end of our discussion. And uh, yeah, Dr. Fahim, so do you take you it from Thank you very much for a very brilliant case and good presentation. And of course, uh, thank Dr. Ankur for presenting in this case very nicely. I uh, thank Professor Call for taking part and, of course, leading the discussion in this uh, webinar today. And I uh, I have no words to thank Dr. Suvarna for a brilliant lecture. Of course, Dr. Fine will give a vote of thanks, uh, but I would like to mention that Dr. Mansi, who is uh, organizing the whole digital team on behalf of the IAN, has done a, a great job. And I also thank the office bearers, particularly President Dr. Devasis Chaudhary and Secretary Dr. Uh, Dr. Minaksa Sundaram for helping us for bringing this webinar. Uh, and I now hand over this to Dr. Fahim to make the final comment and conclude. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, sir, and thank you very much, all sir, Sona Madam and Dr. Angkur for that wonderful discussion. I think your insightful perspectives and valuable inputs and enthusiastic engagement it have really has really enriched all the discussions. And uh, I'm thankful to the audience as well. We had around 40, 140 people joining. Yes. Real great gratitude to everybody who joined, and thanks to Mansi and the technical team, IN, who are always working behind. Yeah, the Pleasure, yeah, and, pleasure. And, and we look forward to continuing our journey of dementia with everyone in future webinars to come. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Thanks, Bye. Dr. Rankur and Dr. Atrik.